Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I guess people are running late today. <laughs> but that's okay. It's a beautiful morning. Happy belated birthday to Patty, uh, whose birthday was yesterday. Yay! Fun. Um, yes, it's a beautiful day to come and worship our God who has come to ransom us from our sins, who has given us his grace. Uh, I pray that as we sing today that we can celebrate uh, the freedom that we have in him, that we know that we are his children forever, um, that he has called each of us to be his sons and daughters, and that he has specifically um, invited us to be in his kingdom um, and to be together with him in heaven one day. Um, so as we bow our, as we bow our heads and prepare our hearts to worship him, I pray that we would just revel in his presence um, and uh, be in awe of who we are standing in front of. So let's pray. He brought me and know oh, his love for me. Oh, his love. Oh 
of what he did on the cross where he poured out his blood for us where he gave himself as the sacrifice for our sins and pray that this would continue to lead us to action continue to give up everything that we have for him Bring me 
example that you have set for us, where you willingly went to the cross, where you willingly took on our sin and our shame and died for us, Lord, so that we could know you, so that we could be redeemed and our relationship with you restored. And we are in awe, Lord, of your holiness. And we are in awe of your mercy and your compassion. And I pray that what you have done will continue to spur us, Lord, and to encourage us to do more. I pray that we would see how you have set this example for us and that we will continue to follow that, Lord, and not just do what the world tells us to do, but that we would yearn for more. I pray that you would continue to give us hearts of obedience, Lord, and that we would keep seeking your will and keep seeking your plan for our lives knowing that as we do so, that we are trusting in a God whose timing is perfect, whose plans and will are perfect. And I pray that that would bring us hope that as we look to the future, that we know that you are already there, and that you are in control of everything. That you hold this whole world in your hands. We know that there is nothing that could ever separate us from your love. And we are so grateful for that. And I pray that we would be able to continue to trust in you. God, thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much uh, for your mercy and your grace. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Just an announcement really quick before, um, before we get into First Thessalonians. Uh, you may have heard, but if you haven't yet, we have a churchwide picnic coming up September 7th. So I wanted to get you the address. I'm not 100% sure of the name of the park. I think it's Wilderness Park, but the address 
is correct. So if you are able to join us on September 7th, the picnic's going to start at 11 o'clock. I know for sure there's going to be a ton of food. That's what I know. And there'll be games and probably singing and just a lot of time to hang out. The following Saturday, um, Lifeline and Impact, we're going to go hiking together if you want to join us in Glendora up at Big Dalton Canyon Trail. So that's about a three and a half mile hike, I believe. Is a loop? It's a loop. Okay, so if you want to join us uh, for the hike in Glendora, um, we're going to meet up there at 930 as well. So we hope you can join us for those two things. Krista will be mentioning that as well, but I want to make sure you have the information if you want to take a picture or try to put it in your phone and remember if you can join us. As we get back into 1 Thessalonians, remember uh, that book is divided into two sections, right? The first part, Paul's saying he's celebrating their faithfulness, and the second part, encouragement for how they're supposed to grow and how you can keep growing. And in the middle is this prayer, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, and that prayer was Paul praying for the people that they would find more and more joy in living in such a way to please Jesus, right? So the motivation in their life and the way they live life is to please Jesus and that their capacity to love would grow because that helps our heart be more and more like Jesus as well. It's easy to love people who love us, um, but there's times that it's hard to love other people, right? And in those moments, we just need more love, right? And so if we need more love, we need more of God's heart, right? Because that has an infinite ability to love. And so that's two of the things that Paul prayed as he went into this section of encouraging them to pray and grow and keep being faithful. And we looked last week at how the principle Paul started with was to just keep doing more, right? Do more of the right thing. Do more of what you're doing and you'll grow, Right? So we looked at how if you're doing the right thing and you do more of it, you're going to grow in that thing. You're going to grow in health. You're going to grow in a skill. You're going to grow in knowledge. If you just keep doing something and you just do it more. Uh, but don't you feel sometimes in life we just hit plateaus? Right? And so we can hit a plateau in, in a skill. Right? We could hit a plateau in a sport. We could hit a plateau in health. Right? We can also hit plateaus spiritually. And there have been times of your life where you feel, I've been growing spiritually, and other times where you go, I did, I'm not growing now like I used to back then. And in the same way, we hit those plateaus. And they could be for a number of reasons, right? Some of the reasons might be that God is testing us to remain faithful in a time that he's more silent, or that he's answering less prayer, or that the prayer, the answer is delayed, or it's a no, Right, but sometimes the reason that we hit those moments is because of the things that we encounter that are just life. Right? If we thought of last week of saying do things more and more, like be in God's word more, right? pray more, um, trust more, share about God more. But life still happens. Right? And sometimes life has, is full of good things and life is full of challenges and life is full of difficult things. And some of those things are, are just by the culture that we live in, right? things that are, that are accepted culturally or even honored culturally that become pressures or influences that would make it hard to follow God. And that's really what, what Paul is getting at is that, that when we choose to follow Jesus, he says in 2 Corinthians that we're a new creation. Right? And the old has gone and the new has come. Right? So this, is, this is tracks with the whole message of 1 Thessalonians that because you came to know Christ, you've done well, you've grown faithfully, you're like a new person and you need to keep growing and keep doing these things and you'll be renewed over and over again. But the fact is we're still us. Right? So it's not the old is gone is that you are a completely different person. We still have a lot of the likes that we used to like. If you like theme parks before you knew Jesus, you probably still like theme parks after you know Jesus. If you're a coffee drinker, you probably are still a coffee drinker, right? If you're a reader, you're probably still a reader, right? Whatever that thing is, we're still us. But a new version of us has begun to emerge, right? And the closer we get to God, the more that new person is going to emerge as well. And maybe you've even experienced that as you've gone to other cultures or other relationships or other phases of life. 
Now, the thing I've I've uh, noticed a lot is the way that certain parts of Indonesian culture have stuck with me, even though we've lived here for over a decade. Even though we're more than 10 years removed from living in Indonesia, some things have gone back to me being more American, but some things are still, like, I just still do them. And I know they're Indonesian from our time there, that whenever I walk by somebody talking to someone else, I always duck. You know, I always like, like, do that, you know, excuse me, right? Because that's just, that's just what you do in Indonesia. And I don't do it because they're Indonesian. I do it because it's become so ingrained in me that there's a new version of me, right? A different way that I live my life. This week, I gave uh, one of the, the guys that we work with at the apartments, I gave him a thank you gift. Just no reason. Just had been really appreciative of him and got him a gift. And I wrote him like a nice card, not just thanks for all your work, you know, or thank you for all you've done, but like more, this is what I've been so thankful for, and this is what I appreciate, and a little personal. And so we sat down in our meeting, just the two of us, and I said, hey, I want to get you this gift just to say thank you. And he goes, oh, great. And he takes the card and he goes, let me read this. Right? And he opens it up and he starts reading it, and my insides are just churning. Because, you know, in, in Indonesia, you don't open gifts in front of people. Right? And so as he's doing this, my Indonesian part is just going like, oh, my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Right? But Americans, you just like open stuff. And then, then you can say thank you. Right? And you say, oh, thank you so much. Oh, these are such kind words. Or I love the gift. Or if you don't love the gift, you lie. And you say, I love the gift. Right? And so that's really what we do. And the funny thing is he was a missions pastor at a really large church. So he's literally traveled the world. And he goes, you know, in a lot of cultures, this actually isn't culturally appropriate for me to do. And my whole time, I'm thinking, did you forget I lived in Indonesia for 10 years? And he goes, but we're friends. And he's reading, and he goes, this is so kind, Steve, you know. <laughs> but the whole time, I'm like, why didn't you listen to what you just told me? Because I'm new, right? Like, I'm different. And that's really what begins to take shape, or what Paul's trying to say should take shape, is you're still going to be you, but you're going to be a different version of you, a newer or a better version of you. And as we get into today, what Paul is starting to say now is sometimes it's not just enough to do more and more of the right thing because you're going to encounter things in life. You're going to encounter things that are challenging. You're going to encounter things that are difficult. And also we live in a culture that doesn't necessarily promote a life that God would promote. And there's a lot of things that following God are countercultural. And so as you encounter everyday things in life, what do you do to keep growing? And he uses one example um, that we're going to look at and then expand upon as well. So I'm going to read out of verse 3 through verse 8, where Paul says this to the church in Thessalonica. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And just keep that verse in mind out of any other verse we're going to read today, because that's really the point that Paul's trying to make. It's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the Gentiles or those who do not know God, and that in this manner no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins, as we told you and we warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject us, but God, the very God who gives us his Holy Spirit. And this is one of those struggles that's been there since the beginning of time, right? This whole sexual immorality that is everywhere, especially in our culture through uh, dating apps, through Tinder, through TikTok, through videos, right? You don't have to look far before you're going to stumble across something that's sexually impure, right? And this is probably more of a guy problem than a girl problem, but the problem has been in every single culture, in every single place, in every single generation. I didn't really look a lot into it, but at least from what I could find, um, it, it seems like this, probably these numbers, maybe they're not 100% accurate, but they're at least ballpark that the porn industry in the U.S. is at least a $10 billion industry. And the global sex trafficking industry is at least a $150 billion industry. Right? And so when you hear that and realize that, you could see it is a huge issue. Right? It is a part 
of every culture. And it is a part of culture that can have certain things accepted as the norm. But even as you go through certain relationships, as Steve is up in Oregon, you know, he says one of the things all the guys talk about is how many girls they sleep with. Right? It's just normal, right? And part of something that has become accepted. But it's been like that forever. And so keep in mind where we started with verse 3, where Paul says this, it's God's will that you should be sanctified. And if you're not quite sure what that word means, it means to be made holy or to be set apart for God's use or to be set apart for special purposes, right? We all have things we set apart for special purposes. Like I have, I have a suit for special purposes, right? Those purposes for me are weddings and funerals and interviews, right? Like that's the only time that the suit comes out. And when the suit comes out, you know, I don't wear my tennis shoes. I don't wear my boots. I have, like, special shoes. Like, those shoes have lasted me over 10 years because I hardly ever wear them. But they're set aside for something special. Right? So that's all really that this word means, is whenever you see that word sanctify or sanctification, it's the process of being made more and more holy because when you say yes to Jesus, in God's mind, he has now set you apart Right? He's pulled us out of the norm of society and culture into a new person to be made new for a special purpose. And as we think about this uh, idea or context, it's all about that there's different norms. There's different things that should be the norm for a life of a person who's followed Jesus and who hasn't. Right? And as we get back into the actual context of the verses about purity and about holiness, back then, uh, one of the things that they would have is they would have temples to different gods and goddesses. So one of the temples that was common back then was the temple to Aphrodite, which if you looked in this region, there was a temple for Aphrodite. And if you don't remember the goddess of Aphrodite, when you study Greek mythology and all of that, she's the goddess of love. But not just love, like, like nice love, like good love, like husband and wife love, or like brotherly and sisterly love. She's the goddess of love, and she's the goddess of lust, and she's the goddess of beauty, and she's the goddess of pleasure, and she's the goddess of passion, and she's the goddess of procreation. Right? She's the goddess of anything healthy or unhealthy that somebody would relate to love. And what had become common back then, especially because of this temple being there and the lifestyle being there, is that these temples would have temple prostitutes. Why not? She's the goddess of love. And so it was acceptable for you to decide that whatever reason you wanted to experience that type of love and you'd head down to the temple and have a sexually immoral moment with a temple prostitute or meet somebody else there who wasn't your spouse and have that happen. And so it was common to have that be acceptable as the norm and not be something that was frowned upon necessarily, not be something that somebody would call you in to check. Where are you going? Oh, I'm going down to the temple. Oh, yeah, like so-and-so or like so-and-so or like you did last month or whatever because it had become acceptable in the culture. Just like we see nowadays of so many things where things are simply acceptable in the culture. But what Paul says, and he keeps trying to pull us back to this and even other books, is that you were bought with a price, right? That your life was, had the value of Jesus' life. That he bled on the cross, that he suffered and that he died, and you were bought. But not just that. Then he goes on to say, so therefore, honor God with your body. Right, to keep in mind that the things that you do with your body is one of the ways that you actually honor the sacrifice that God made for us. And it is the way that we are actually called to be different. Now, this is just one example, right, of something that all cultures have struggled with and their culture back then did as well, especially because of this temple. But if we went back to the passage, right in the middle, you see the underline and bolded word, the, the phrase, to take advantage of, right? And so Paul says this, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. And sometimes in the original language of the Bible, the Greek in the New Testament, sometimes you actually get some really unique word pictures 
to help you understand the gist or the point behind what the person's trying to say. And the word that take advantage of comes from is the only word of its kind that appears in the entire New Testament. So this is the one occurrence in the whole New Testament that this word pops up. And this word, I probably won't say it right, but it's huperbinen or something like that. Uh, if you speak Greek and have a better pronunciation than I do. But that's the Greek word. And what that word means is that there is a barrier. Most often that barrier is considered a wall or like a mountain range, right? And you are approaching that wall or that mountain range and it's not intended to be crossed, right? It's like your neighbor's fence, right? And you're playing something and your ball goes over your neighbor's fence. That on the one hand, if you have a good relationship with your neighbor, you just hop the fence and go get it. But if you don't really have a relationship with your neighbor, it's like you shouldn't go on the other side. That's their yard, Right? And if you do, you probably feel a little nervous or like, I better run and get back because that line is a line that is not intended to be crossed. And so when you, Hooper Bynan, you actually approach a barrier like a wall and you begin to scale it. You begin to overpass the mountains. You begin to climb over it. And then as you do, you just keep going further and further on the other side. And as you go further and further on the other side, the point is you've gone too far. That wall was there for a reason, right? That wall was there to protect you. That wall was there to help you know there was a line, and you crossed that line, right? And when it comes to sexuality, there is a line, and far too often we get too close to that line, and we scale the wall, and we cross the line. And once you cross the line, you've gone too far. Right? And when it comes to lying or when it comes to cheating or when it comes to gossip or when it comes to so much that can be culturally acceptable, there's going to be a line. That line is really for our good. Right? And that line also helps us to be different. Right? That line helps Steve to be in the fire truck and the guys to talk about who they slept with last weekend and them to say, Steve, what about you? And he goes, oh, I've never done that. Why haven't you crossed that line? What's the difference? Right? And that's really what's designed to happen. And this point of sexual morality is a point that Paul brought up because of their context. But the bigger point is that there's so much in culture that tells us it's okay to do certain things. And if we follow culture as our guideline instead of God's word as our guideline, we can always be a little better than culture. We can always say, well, I haven't gone that far, but I've gotten up to the wall, right? Or I've hopped on the other side of the mountain, but I haven't, like, entered into the territory. But what God says is to use my ways as your standard, right, as your guideline. That's why far too often in our world, people who say they follow Jesus end up looking a lot like everybody else, right? They're really nice people sometimes, hopefully, Right? There's, but there's no difference between me and them. But what Paul is saying is there's got to be a difference between you and them if you follow Jesus because you have been sanctified. You've been bought with a price. You have been set aside for special purposes. There's a way to do things the right way. And that is really what Paul is trying to get at. That sanctification isn't just a, a thing that you do in life, but it's a thing that you go through that affects every branch of your life, or maybe you could say every root of your life. That sanctification, this process of becoming more like God, it's going to impact how you are at school. It's going to impact how you are at home. It's going to impact what you do with money. It's going to impact what you pursue as a passion. It's going to impact how you look at your phone. And when a video does come up, how long you stay on it or not, what you spend time doing when nobody's looking. It's going to affect every single one of these areas. So while we might be pretty good in an area, while we might say like, oh, I'm, I'm actually very honest when it comes to money, we potentially could be very poor in an area. I don't do too well when it comes to sexuality and staying pure. And so what Paul's saying is what sanctification does is it keeps in mind that every one of these roots has to become more and more like God, more and more holy, more and more sanctified or set apart because they all have walls that are there for our good as boundaries, right? And we should not hooper bind in them because you're going to get to a point where you've gone too far, 
And when you've gone too far, sometimes you can't go back. And so as we keep looking at this, you know, there's, there's one story I keep coming back to over and over and over again because it's what culture says is okay, right? And, and my first trip to Fiji what, what took me to an outer island where our family was from originally, and that island had one village, about 100, 150 people. And, I, and we went out there for a few days, and as we went out there, I met a guy named Jack who was Fijian from the village, but had lived in Australia for a long time. So he was very Western. He spoke English really well. Some of the people in the village didn't speak English that well. And I was really drawn to him and his story. And as we spent time together, we were walking through the village, and he came up to this outline of a house made out of cinder blocks. So just two cinder blocks high of an out outline of a house with rebar sticking up out of it and grass overgrown around the border of the house. And he said, Steve, look. Look at this. That's my house. And I remember saying, well, congratulations. He goes, yeah, my dream was to, to build a house in my village. So whenever I come and visit, I have a house. And I actually thought of retiring and coming back to the island and, and living out my days with my people in my village. And I was like, that's a great idea, right? And, and he said, but do you know who I've hired to, to do the work? My family like the people in the village. Like, I make okay money in Australia, and it's even better when I send it back to Fiji, right? And, and I thought, I could get a house, I could get a place to retire, I could get a place to stay, I could employ my family and my friends who are stuck in the village. But do you know I've sent enough money to build two or three homes, and this is all I have? Do you know how much money they've stolen from me? And I was shocked, right, in my naive mind at the time. Like, how could that be? But his question to me that has always stuck with me wasn't, like, how could my family do this? How could my friends do this to me? He said, how could Christians do this, Steve? You're here as a missionary. How could a Christian do this? And I had no answer, because they never should have. But you see, you can if you follow the cultural norms. Because the cultural norms was that when you got paid a whole bunch of money, you kept a whole lot of it, and then you did just enough work to please the person. I mean, in Indonesia, the roads are in pretty bad shape, and potholes pop up all the time. And they seem every year after the rains that more potholes pop up. And, and I began to learn that people would say, you know why we always have potholes? Because the contractor gets all the money from the government, and they keep half of it in their pocket, so they use cheaper materials to go patch the road. And that way, next year, they get the contract again. What would happen, Steve? What would happen if an honest contractor just fixed the road right? Could you imagine how much money our government would have to help with other problems? And, and so what begins to happen is the guideline that we have or the norm that we accept is actually a cultural norm. And why is it that that happens? And I hope you could begin to think with me that the really root cause that this happens is because of broken relationships, right? The reason that, that somebody would go to a temple to find a prostitute is because there was a broken relationship between their, themselves and their spouse or because their understanding of what sexuality is supposed to be, right? God says sexuality is a good thing, but it can also be corrupt as well. So there's a broken relationship between an understanding of what God intended and as we look at these things, we could say, why would you steal money? Because I have a broken relationship with, with greed or with honesty or with integrity. But there's always going to be a deeper issue, right? So the broken relationship isn't just with the branch or the root of that segment of life. But I hope you could believe with me that it really is a reflection of our broken relationship with God. As we've looked in the past at how a lot of trees grow, they have that main root, that tap root that goes to the bottom. And all the other roots come out from it, but the tap root is there to give it life. When the other roots can't find enough water, at least that tap root is sunk deep enough to find life for the tree when the others are having trouble finding life. So that one root actually affects every other root. And that one root is our connection to God. 
And so the reason that you would fall into sexual morality is because of our relationship with God. The reason why you would steal money from somebody is because of our relationship with God. Really, at, when that becomes more damaged, it shows up in other areas of our lives. But when we become more whole, it also shows up in other areas of our life as wholeness, as health, as seeing the lines or the boundaries and not crossing them. And so really the root of all of this, Paul's trying to point to, is a relationship to God. And is it broken? Is it hurting? Or is it healthy? And is it whole? Because it will be seen by people around us. That's why, this is a different translation, but that's why at the end of the passage we looked at today, God said, or Paul said, God didn't choose you to be filthy or impure, but to be pure. But here's where he brings it back to God. So if you don't obey these ways, you're not really disobeying us, right? You're really disobeying God, who has given you his Holy Spirit. If you remember what Jesus said about the Spirit is to be your guide, to be your counselor, to convict the world of sin, to help be the wall or mountain range that you come up to, and the Spirit will say, don't go up that mountain, right? Don't scale that wall. Because if you do, and you end up on the other side, you're going to go too far. And that's really what Paul is trying to say, is there's got to be a difference between people who choose to follow Jesus and who don't. And far too often, there isn't. And so because there isn't, it actually affects not just us and our own heart, but it affects the way other people will either believe in Jesus or deny Jesus. And you, you saw Peter up here a few weeks ago and heard his, some of his story. Um, and maybe some of you knew him from when they were serving here as well. But part of Peter's story that you didn't hear, that he didn't share, is that as he grew up, he did grow up in the church. Uh, but a lot of difficult things started to happen. And later in his childhood, he lost his mom to cancer. He was just with his dad. His dad was not a really good man and is not a very good man to this day. His dad was a car salesman and then ended up owning his own used car lot and was the stereotypical negative used car salesman. And he would catch his dad lying, deceiving customers just to get more money. He said, I'd come home and I'd play our, our answering machine and my dad would just be talking randomly to somebody, pretending he was talking to his boss, talking to the customer, saying, I'm sorry, I can't drop that $2,000. My boss won't let me. Right? And over and over, Peter and his older brother would just see lies that would be told by his dad. And then he would also see how his dad would treat him, which is a very uh, just mean and evil way. Right? And to this day has caused damage for him and his brother's relationship together, as well as their relationship with his dad. And he got to a point where he began to know, like, this is wrong. This isn't right. I am actually more honest than my dad. I am actually a kinder person than my dad. But Steve, my dad is a leader in the church. How can that be? And I'm like, you're right. It's not right. But that's not who Jesus is. But he goes, but look, this is who my dad is. Right? And it became the biggest thing that got in the way of Peter even believing that God was real. Because the person who was supposed to be protector, defender, example, was the worst example. Right? And so that's why Paul says in Romans 12 that actually our mind needs to be transformed, not to just conform to things in this world that are acceptable. Because what begins to happen is this, where Jesus says, your light or your actions, your life, is going to shine in a way that people see. Like, people see what we do. They might not know why we do what we do, but what we do is seen by people. And so Jesus says, be mindful of that, because they could see your works, the things that you do, and they could honor your Father, which is in heaven. So that's why there should be a difference between those who say they follow Jesus and those who don't. Because in Peter's case, the thing that kept him away from God was his dad, because he saw his dad's actions, and it kept him away. But as he got older, he tell you there were three people who kept coming up in his life that wouldn't give him the freedom to believe that God was wrong, that God was a lie, that God was, was a myth. And he said, one was me as we were spending junior high, high school, and college together. One was an older lady named Barbara that he met in grad school. And another was Jane, who was the matriarch of a family that took Peter in when he had a ton of health issues when his own dad wouldn't take him in and take care of him. 
I said, those, you three guys, you were normal people, you were logical people, you were smart people, and you all followed Jesus. If it weren't for you three, I would have given up because I had enough evidence to say God's not real, or if he is, I don't want any part of him. And Jesus says, your actions, your light is going to shine, and people are going to see, and it's supposed to draw people to him. And eventually, Peter did believe that God was out there and believe God was real and give his life to Jesus. And when he got baptized, we were in Indonesia. And so when we came back for Mia's birth, uh, he came down to meet us at my parents' house, and he showed me the video of his baptism. Right? And in his baptism, like we do here sometimes, he shared, right? And he shared about a verse and about his journey of faith. And, and he opened up to Jeremiah, you know, and he, he read this verse. And he shared about how that verse had been key to helping him believe in God. And I was like, Peter, wait. And I ran to the room and I got my Bible and I opened my Bible. It's not this Bible. It's an older Bible. I opened it to Jeremiah and I found that verse, and I go, look, look what's right next to that verse. And if you read, it said Peter. And I said, you know, I was reading this passage, and as I read it, I knew that God was saying, if Peter would just do this, he would believe. And so I wrote your name here, so I'd always pray this verse for you. And he said, when did you write that? And I said, I wrote it about four years ago. Why did you pick that verse? He goes, because that's the verse that was convincing to me to really pursue God and let go of the baggage that my dad had created in my life. You see, the reason that we have to be different is because it's not just about us, right? It's about the way that God's reputation gets painted or stained and about giving people an excuse to not follow God or giving people a reason to follow God, right? And, and as we think about this concept, right? Paul is talking about this whole process of what sexual immorality does, but it's just indicative of a bigger picture. It's not just that if you're sexually pure that everything works out, right? We have multiple branches and, and segments of our lives that need to be made more holy. And if we're not growing in holiness in these areas, it's not just because that area is off. It's because our connection to God is off. And that relationship has been broken Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 7. My friends, God has made us promises. So we should stay away from everything that keeps our bodies and our spirits from being clean. We should honor God and try to be completely like him. That when we fall into sexual morality, it's not because we just are weak in that area. right? It's because there's a broken relationship in how we have a relationship with our husband or wife. Or how we have a broken relationship between men and women. Or even how we have a broken relationship between our understanding of what sexuality is supposed to be because God called it good. Right? If we, if we steal money from people who want to build a house and they trust us to do it and we steal that money, it's not because we just have this problem and, and we want to take advantage of someone. But we have a brokenness when it comes to honesty, when it comes to integrity, when it comes to greed. And we don't just lie about things to get ahead. It's because of the brokenness that we have that really ultimately is our brokenness in our connection or relationship to God. And that when those become better, right, our life begins to change. That's why Paul said it's God's will that you be sanctified, that you be holy, because it matters, because it speaks volumes to the world that we're called to be different. So as we close, I just want you to think about this question. If the influence of God and his Holy Spirit is greater in your life or the norms of society and culture guiding you to find what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And if there are actually branches in our life that we need to be cut off or changed radically so that we could look at the brokenness in our relationship with God and find wholeness there and see the growth that can happen right, as we begin to live differently. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you never give up on us. That even though there are those times that we have hooper bind into wall, right? That we have crossed a line that you have set up for us for our good. That you can still redeem us. You can still bring us back. You can still help us to respect the boundaries again. That maybe cultures say it doesn't matter. 
Everybody's living with their boyfriend or girlfriend. It doesn't matter. Everybody goes out and parties. It doesn't matter. Everybody looks at those videos online. It doesn't matter to society or to culture. Help us to remember it matters deeply to you. And it hurts you. It hurts us, but it also hurts those around us when we don't choose to be made holy. That actually part of your plan for our growth is to come into the world but be different than the world, to not conform to the things that are accepted in the world, to be transformed as we walk through this life and encounter things. Help us to believe, God, that that we only need to look as far as our relationship and connection to you to find health and wholeness there and allow that to trickle out through every area of our lives. So please, God, help us to live a pure life, a holy life. Help us to find freedom in being guided by the boundaries that you set, realizing it's for our own good, but it's also for the good of those around us to see how amazing it is to follow you. Help us not be the reason people wouldn't believe in you, but help us to be the reason that they believe a God might exist. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. May we continue to ask God to sanctify us, to make us his, uh, to purify us, to make us his sanctuary, that others, uh, when they see our lives, that they would be pointed to God instead of pointing away from God. Uh, Let's stand and sing together.
heads and pray once again. God, thank you so much that you call us to be transformed, and that you have given us the power of resurrection and the power of transformation, that we know that because of what you did for us on the cross, that our old selves have also died with you, and that we will rise with you as well. I pray that that would continue to be true in our lives, Lord, that we would be sanctified, that we would be set apart, that we would be made holy because of who you are. I pray that in everything that we do, that you would continue to purify us, Lord, that we would see the things that we do, that we may partake in, that, that our culture may say is normal um, and is even expected. I pray that we would instead be held to higher standards, that we would instead look to your example and see what you call us to do. Lord, continue to make us your temple, to make us your sanctuary, that when others look at our lives, that instead of pointing away from you, Lord, that we would be pointing to you, that others would be drawn to you because of, of what we say, what we do, instead of pushed away. God, thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for uh, washing us and making us clean. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may all be seated. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, Brian's going to walk around with the offering. Um, as Steve mentioned, the announcements for this week, next uh, in a couple weeks, September 7th, we're going to be having the church picnic, and that's with everybody in the Indonesian church as well. Um, and that's going to be at Wilderness Park in Downey. If you need the address, please let us know. And that's going to be at 11 a.m. Um, and then on Saturday, September 14th, we're going to be going hiking in Glendora at Big Dalton Canyon Trail. So again, please join us for that if you're interested. Um, this Thursday, we will be having prayer meetings. So that's this Thursday at 8 o'clock on Zoom. Uh, so please join us for that if you'd like. And also, I have a special announcement that this past Friday, Carissa Lim got married up in San Francisco um, in a civil ceremony with her now husband, Josh. So please send them your congratulations and please congratulate uh, on Paul and Tanda Shafi as well. Thank you everyone for coming. Happy Sunday.